Hey everybody, Stephen Paul Matsumoto with You Knows Liquor. Today we're going to be talking about how Scotch style whiskey came to Japan. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining. If you Junos, you know this is uh, the Junos Liquor Podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple iTunes or transistor.fm. Today, we're going to be talking to Jermaine Davis, and he is going to be telling us about Nico Whiskey. Uh, Jermaine is a 10-year veteran of the spirits industry. So, Jermaine, tell us how you got into the spirits industry and a little bit about your career progression. Oh, definitely. Well, thank you for letting me join the show. I've always wanted to do a podcast, and um, definitely something that I want to talk to you about is Japanese whiskey, I love it. I love the culture. Um, but basically how I got into the alcohol industry, of course, um, like everyone else in the world, was at a young age. Um, not a tender young age. Um, this was a college age. So I had a basically a marketing class when I was in college, um, back at the time when the company was called Just Glazers before they did Emerge. Um, and they basically came to my class. They were telling, telling us about the company. It was kind of right up my alley, even though I didn't really drink until I was about 23. Um, I just thought it was a cool career. Um, and after that, they basically recruited me and right out of college, I went straight to working for them. I started off um, selling wine at grocery stores, did different um, avenues and different in, um, positions and basically ended up working on the spirit side of the company at Southern Glazers. And, um, worked my way up to being a manager and then started to, after I was at the distributor, um, I wanted to work for the supplier just to gain a little bit more knowledge and see how that kind of realm of business works. So that's basically how I got into the alcohol industry um, and been here for 10 years. So ever since college. There we go. And um, what company are you with now? So right now I'm currently with Hodelin & Co. Um, it's kind of like a big importer, but they also have some of their own products as well. Um, we're really known for our Luxardo portfolio, which is Italian portfolio, our, of course, Nika, which we're here to talk to you about, um, our Japanese portfolio, whiskey. Um, and I mean, the list can go on. We have Hein Cognac. It's a really um, old cognac house back in the 1700s. Just a lot of different products, but they're a great company, um, San Francisco based company, and we're basically imported. But like I was saying before, we also have um, a couple other products that we make like Hirsch um, whiskey. So great okay. company. Yeah. Moving your way through the three tier system. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Well, you know, what was the first whiskey uh, that Nika created? So Nika first created um, Nika Yoichi, and it's actually named after the Yoichi distillery. Um, it wasn't really called Yoichi. Now it's called Yoichi. Um, it was it, it basically the name was just Nika um, back in the day. They, they also have like an old packaging. And um, if you see the old bottle back from 1940, it's a really cool bottle. If you, It kind of mimics um, the Nika from the barrel um, that we also have up here. Okay. So it's just a little bit taller. So that was basically the first whiskey that they made um, from the Nika distillery. Okay. Well, what, tell me more about the history of Nika. I mean, how did Nika get started? So first off, let's talk about what actually is um, a Japanese whiskey. So okay. to be considered a Japanese whiskey, you need about five points. So um, it needs to be filtered in Japan. It needs to be um, the water source. The water source has to come from Japan as well. Um, it has to be distilled in Japan. It has to have some um, grain, malted grain in there as well. And it also has to be bottled in Japan. So. Those five key points is what basically makes uh, Japanese whiskey. And with that being said, I can talk a little bit more about Japanese whiskey and the, the roots and kind of like a brief history of um, Japanese whiskey. So about in the 1800s, um, turn of the centuries leading into the 1900s, um, whiskey in Japan wasn't really whiskey. Um, there are some people, of course, there's some imports, but there wasn't really a production of Japanese whiskey. Um, people actually weren't even drinking um, whiskey. They thought they were drinking whiskey, but it was really, it was sake that they actually had um, dyed, flavored additives. Um, it was a knockoff okay. whiskey, basically. It was basically. a knockoff, okay. Yeah. Bathtub and, gin. Yeah, basically, <laughs> and people really didn't know. I mean, you're yeah. in Japan, uh, turn of the century, 
the world's still kind of land like locked in place. There wasn't really a lot of travel. So if you taste something and you think it's whiskey, I mean, um, it's whiskey. You can kind of fake it until you make it. So enter the picture, um, Shinjiro um, Tori, and the name will sound familiar because he made um, Kotobukiya, which is basically um, Centauri of today. Um, everyone knows what Centauri is. It's Yamazaki whiskey. Um, of course, it's right now it's the leader of Japanese whiskeys. Um, but I can dive into that a little bit more. So he wanted to make um, authentic Japanese whiskey. And he basically f um, went out and found Masataka Takatsuru. So for those that don't know, Masataka Takatsuru was basically named the father of Japanese whiskey. So why he was given that title, I'll kind of break it down a little bit more and go to his backstory. So he was born in about as well, the turn of the century, um, 1894, 1893. Um, don't quote me on that, to be exact. One of those <laughs> years. Um, anyway, to a sake family. Like I was saying, everything was basically sake back then. Um, he went to university, learned chemistry, and he was actually, after he left that university, he actually went to work for a sake company named, I want to say Setsu um, Shuzo, um, they actually, they were the ones that tasked him with going to Scotland to learn how to make whiskey, bring it back to Japan so we can make our own Japanese whiskey. So turns out he goes to Scotland, um, has three apprenticeships at three different distilleries, meets his wife, really enjoys it. Um, and we all know how the Japanese culture is about perfection and perfection. He actually literally sketches out everything, maps everything on how he wants to present this whiskey to Japan, um, takes a lot of notes, brings that information back, but leaves the company after about a three year period. And that's where um, Mr. To um, Shinjiro Tori camp comes into the picture, kind of basically snags him. Hey, come to my company. Um, let's make whiskey. You can make the first whiskey in Japan. So um, he comes back and he makes the whiskey uh, from Yamazaki. That's why he's named the father of Japanese whiskey, because he created uh, the Yamazaki brand as what we know today um, in mass production. So that's a history of basically a Japanese whiskey. Now, of course, um, the history continues because he didn't stay there too long. He had to create Nika as well. So now on to the history of Nika. So. Masataka Taketsuru left um, Kotobukiya, which is Yamazaki, um, to create his own company. And that was around 1934. Um, now, he did a little bit of pit stop before launching Nika. Um, of course, you have to create funds. It's a big operation. So he actually made, I'm not going to say the Japanese name because it's really long, but it's basically the great um, apple juice company. Um, it's a really long title, and my Japanese is not that great, so I'm not going to say it. So basically, he used that funds to um, make his own distillery. Um, and then Nika started, actually, he started distilling back in 1936. Um, the first Nika came out in 1940. But a little backstory about Masataka Takatsuru. Um, when he wanted to make scotch, um, not scotch, Japanese whiskey, like I was saying, he came over with the idea of, copy in Scotland as much as he can. So like I said, the first um, Nika whiskey is the distillery is called Yoichi. If you look at Yoichi and um, the Japanese map, it's far north. I mean, the distillery is right next to a river and it's 20 blocks, 20 or so blocks, a little bit more from the ocean. It's right there in the ocean. The same thing with Migekyo, um, the climate, the locations, just about the same because he's copying that location, that idea of, hey, Scotch, for in order for it to be a good whiskey, it needs to be in these locations, this climate, just to kind of mimic and copy it. So with those two major distilleries, Yoichi being the first one and Migekyo being the second one, um, you can kind of tell that he definitely, his ideas were there to make Scotch, um, but Japanese to make his whiskey. Um, and with that being said, there's a couple of cool things that he actually did. Um, now there's processes. I like to call the the styles of um, his whiskeys, I call one part the old age whiskey and the other part's new age whiskey, which is the grain whiskey that you'll we'll talk about a little bit later. So what's cool about Yoichi is, um, yes, they're using copper pots, but they're heating the copper pots with coal. So if you were to taste a Yoichi, um, 
it's it's kind of the same. Um, it's not exactly the same because most of the products were aged. They had age statements, but the OHE that you see is basically this is um, a grown up version or basically a passed down tradition of what his first whiskey was. Um, so that coal fire is going to seep through there. Of course, it's still peated, um, slightly peated. And then we have the Migekyo distillery, which is going to be um, the copper pots are actually going to be heated with steam. So it's almost the same blend and base. Migekyo is a little bit less peated, but the difference is, is just crazy. I call the Yoichi more of a traditional Scotch drink, the Migekyo more of a, a new age Scotch. It still got a little bit of that peat, but it's definitely fruity for those people that like sherry cast. Um, so it's two different unique characteristics. Now, after he made those distilleries, he decided um, I wanted to bring a continue a coffee still to Japan. Now, for people that don't know what a coffee still is, some people say, why and is that's there... not coffee like Starbucks? Yeah, there's <laughs> not, it's not coffee. Like, it's definitely not coffee like Starbucks. And it's a it's a massive still. It's I don't know exactly how high and story wise you're talking about, like four or five stories um, high distillery um, um, still. It's really large. So he actually imported those stills from Scotland um, to Japan in the 60s. Now, why did he do that? It's because he basically learned how to make whiskeys off of a coffee still before he learned any other skill um, still. So he wanted to basically bring that um, to Japan as well and started making his whiskeys. Um, and he had these four points of ideas of also it's kind of like a progression of when he came back to Japan and how he's making his whiskey. Yoishi, of course, was the start. Um, but like I said, he brought the coffee still. So his main ideas was I need to pick good location. I need to make sure that I'm using malted whiskeys. I need to make sure I'm blending because that's all scotch basically does is blend. And he also wanted to make sure that he's using green um, whiskeys on a coffee still. Now, with that being said, like I was saying, there's a new age kind of idea mentality of how he made us um, whiskeys to an, like a later age. Um, you have Yoichi and Migekyo. Those are like the true original OGs of Japanese whiskeys, his ideas. Um, and then you have your grain whiskeys. That's going to be the Nika coffee grain. And then you got your Nika coffee malt. Now, they all have kind of different differences and ideas and um, basically how they're going to taste. The old age being it's going to be more of that traditional scotch. The new age is going to be kind of a separate product. And also the Nika um, coffee grain is going to have actually corn in it. So it's, it's going to be more or less like a bourbon um, kind of taste, kind of. So versus just the regular coffee malt, which is going to be your new age, um, non-peated, no peat in it at all, 100% malted barley um, kind of taste. And that's kind of like Nika in a nutshell. Now, Nika can kind of get a little bit crazy on what they're making. There's lots of different products. Um, I was going to say, we got about, yeah. what we got, <laughs> just shy of a dozen bottles here yeah. in front of us. <laughs> and to be honest, I want to say, uh, don't quote me, but in the last 20 years, there's probably been... 40 different bottles. I mean, we could probably fill this whole table up if we <laughs> wanted to um, with Nika products, just because it's, they're really experimenting and trying to build onto the legacy of Masataka Takatsuru um, on what they're bringing and what they're offering to the world. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, you know, I really appreciate that history on it. You know, a, everyone stay tuned because we are going to be making a signature cocktail from Nika that what did it, I think it won the world's best cocktail yes. at a Paris bar competition in yeah. 2013. Yeah. So stay tuned so you can learn how to make uh, the best Manhattan in the world circa 2013. Looking for a reliable general contractor in North Texas, Oklahoma and beyond? Choose to see GC, your trusted partner in construction excellence. As an SBA certified veteran owned small business and Texas HUB certified, contractor we bring dedication expertise and a commitment to quality to every project from start to finish stucy gc delivers unmatched service contact us today and build with confidence stucy gc where precision meets passion Hey everybody, Stephen Paul Matsumoto with Juno's Liquor. Welcome back. Now, Jermaine is going to demonstrate how to make the 
Mika's Perfect Manhattan, an award-winning cocktail from the Paris Cocktail Show, won Best Cocktail of 2013, and we are using the exact ingredients that they used to make that cocktail and win that award. So, Jermaine, right. take it away. So, making a cocktail, I am not a chemist or you know, full expert, but everyone, I would say everyone, if you wanted to make cocktails at home, it's definitely the experiment, trial and error. Whatever you like, add a little bit more, experiment, but we're gonna be following these recipes. So I'm gonna, of course, be using a Luxardo um, cherries. Now, anyone and everyone knows that Luxardo cherries is the original. If you're using whatever cocktail that you're using, you should definitely be using the Luxardo cherries. Um, we're gonna be using, of course, a Nika coffee green. Um, we're gonna be using a dry vermouth and also a sweet vermouth. And then we have some bitters. Um, you're gonna need a screen, of course. Of course, your shot glass um, and some ice for this. Now, let's start it off with pouring in about two shots of, I'm gonna make it four shots because I'm making two drinks. Yep, so that's four ounces to make two cocktails, two ounces to make one cocktail of the Kofi Green Whiskey. And I said Kofi again instead of coffee. <laughs> it sounds like an up north accent is coming out. <laughs> Maybe. I did move here from Seattle. Well, there we go. All right. Now, for our dry vermouth, we're going to be using about, well, I could just use one ounce since we're making yep, two since cocktails. we're making two. So if you're making one for yourself at home, it is a half ounce of each of the dry and the sweet vermouth. Onto our sweet vermouth one ounce and if you like if you like the vermouth flavor whichever one you like for the most um, you can add a little bit more vermouth I like vermouth but of course I'm going to stick to um, the recipe we're going to use about four drops if that's two dashes of Angostura bitters for one cocktail or four for two or progresses as as you make more and now I'm going to add some ice you could shake this, but we're gonna do this stir. Um, yeah, I think the when I was researching, the they did a stirred Manhattan versus a shaken one. Yeah. I think that just, it doesn't water it down as much as my understanding. Okay. Only thing we forgot today, folks, because I failed, was to bring in a fresh orange or lemon so that you could express that yeah. zest over the top of it. I so was just thinking I'm about I'm going to own that fail. I apologize. All right. We try our best to be perfect, but unfortunately, you know, we're all human. Nice. All right. All right. Don't forget the cherries. I like to double up my cherries. I just love cherries. There Steven, you do go. you want one or two? I'll just do one. Okay. Awesome. That looks amazing. And Manhattans are one of my personal favorite cocktails. Um, Kanpai. Kanpai. We're talking about Japanese whiskey. Why not? <laughs> mm. Oh, that's good. I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> Jermaine, thank you so much no for problem. all of this. This has been amazing. Uh, hopefully we'll have you back. I, it's like you've got a large portfolio yeah. of products. So um, next time that French ambassador's in town, we definitely need to get him on the show and definitely. talk about his cognac experiences. No problem. I, lo <laughs> I loved it. I enjoyed it. It was fun. I definitely like to come back and talk about a couple other brands that we have. Outstanding. Everyone cheers. Come by. Hey folks, Stephen Paul Matsumoto here with Juno's Liquor. Just wanted to let you know that we have recently rolled out a special order process. So if you have a large party or event, please ask us and we can help you plan how much you're gonna need for that event. We've got a great party calculator. You tell us how many people, how long the party is, and we'll tell you how much wine, spirits, and beer you're gonna need for that party. And then we can special order anything that we don't currently have in the store. We just get a small deposit on one of our gift cards to make sure you come back for it. But 
Anyway, we wanna be there for you for all of your special life events. So ask one of us at the store how you can special order for your large anniversaries, weddings, birthdays, corporate celebrations, what have you. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Hey everyone, welcome back to If You Do Knows You Know, Stephen Paul Matsumoto with Juno's Liquor. And on this segment, we're gonna talk about behind the counter, how stores operate. And we're gonna talk about gift cards. Everyone knows that gift cards are a great way to get someone a gift if you're not sure what their favorite beverage is, but there's actually really good economics as a business owner behind gift cards. And I'm gonna use Starbucks as an example because of their app-based system and some data from an article in Inc. Magazine in 2020 showed that on average, Starbucks generally has about $1.4 billion preloaded onto their app and gift cards. Now, that's a lot of money, which allows Starbucks as a business to leverage that money to grow and scale without having to incur debt from a financial institution. So they essentially become their own bank. Now, another thing that happens with gift cards, and because Starbucks is a very data-driven company and we try to emulate a lot of what we do at Juno's based off of Starbucks, is that about $141 million of that money ends up never being used. Um, now, of course, as a business, I want you to use your gift cards. I want the people you give your gift cards to, to use them. But statistically, a lot of people either forget about them, don't use them, uh, what have you. But as a business, gift cards are a great way for us to improve our cash flow and our cash reserves so that we can open more stores or buy more inventory at larger quantities to pass cost savings onto you, our customer. So like right now, Juno's is in the process of opening our second store in Dallas County. And one of the things that could really help us is an increase in gift card sales. Now, I know that sounds self-serving, but it's just the nature of business. So if you're another liquor store and you're not using gift cards, you know, you might want to look into it. I don't want to encourage our competitors to do things to take business away from us. But the whole point of this behind the counter segment is to educate you on the business of running a liquor store. So I wanna say thank you to everyone that has helped us grow to the point where we are able to financially open a second store and stay tuned to the podcast so that we can announce when and where that store is gonna open. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a blessed day.